For this morning, I was in the back a little bit and um, just watched you worship. I, I know a lot goes on in your hearts that I don't see. I know that. But what I did see just was very, very encouraging to see what, how you were entering into our worship time this morning. It just deeply encouraged my heart. My heart's been encouraged just from being back with the worship team in the prayer time before the service. Those prayers were authentic, um, they were vulnerable, they were real, and they were relying on God to do his thing here and now. And that was just a huge blessing uh, to me. So where is Greg back there? Yeah, Greg will miss you. He's heading to Shippensburg University uh, this coming week. And so, yeah, let's give Greg a, a little, yeah. He's, yeah. he's not real happy I did that at this point, but... Um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk that at this point. So do keep praying for all the other students that are, that are settling in, college students um, in particular, teachers settling in this week, students next week, really looking forward to that. Prayer time on Wednesday night. Uh, if you haven't given that a second thought, I really encourage you to give that thought um, to be at uh, Carrie and Spencer's and do some praying together for students and teachers coming into this, coming into this year. So... Um, it is good, really good to be back with you. Cindy and I had uh, a couple weeks away um, with uh, Anna, our uh, youngest daughter, Karis, uh, came down with her friend Adam a little bit down to North Carolina. So we had some good time in North Carolina, but by the way, oh, I just forgot. Um, we need to welcome um, Caden Thomas for the first time, I think, is in the space, right? So Melissa and Joel, uh, Caden, is this the first Sunday back? Yes, so let's give a welcome to Caden Thomas. I got that in a brand, brand new. Um, what did we refer to him anyway? He's uh, he's here, and uh, we are really thrilled. It's good to good to see you guys. So, so we were away for a couple weeks, and one of the ideas that our uh, oldest daughter had was that she would give Cindy and I a couple of days. Um, away, which we were very grateful for. And so we decided just to spend a couple days in D.C. I don't know if you've had that experience that some place so special is so close, and yet we really don't get down there. We haven't for a while. So Cindy remembered that there had been two um, museums that we had not uh, been to before. So we went to the Holocaust Museum uh, first. Well, we didn't actually go there first. I'll tell you the, the sequence in a second. But we visited the Holocaust Museum and they have this really pretty significant, uh, for me anyway, um, encouragement that when you walk in, you pick up uh, an identification card. And all of a sudden, all the, the immensity of those photographs and that story all of a sudden becomes very, very, very personal. Could we have that um, first image up? Um, this is Alfred. He enjoyed skiing, he played soccer. He married Badriska. They had a son named Thomas. It's not just a face, it's a man. In 1944, they headed to Auschwitz. His son and wife were killed there. In March of 1945, Alfred died of pneumonia in a slave camp, central Germany. He was 33 years old. But then in the brochure, we saw this photograph. The policeman, an SS official, and a dog. Cindy and I were there for four hours. They said it takes about an hour per floor. Uh, we must have been a little slow on the uptake, and we were there for a good four hours. We read a lot. We thought a lot. At some point, my emotions were such at a, a place that you've maybe had this before. I, I wondered if I would ever be hungry again. My appetite was gone, and we hadn't eaten, we'd eaten very little that day, but all of a sudden, my appetite was gone. And I realized I was wrestling how do we do this? How do we live in a world? How do I live in a world? How do we live in a world where this kind of thing actually happened? How do we deal with people that are oppressed like this? 
and others? How do we deal with the oppressors? Because I'm glad this photograph is still up. Those two men had family, maybe children. They had a birthday. They had hopes. They had dreams. They were people. They were humanity created in the image of God as well. How do we deal with the oppressors? How do we deal with the oppressed? So that was the second day. And fortunately, the first day, we went to the Museum of the Bible. We had never been there before. We had heard about it. We had never been there before. And Cindy thought, let's do that. And I'm thankful we did that because the Museum of the Bible helped us. It gave us context. It reminded me of God's story. It reminded me of God's heart for both the oppressed and the oppressor. The Museum of the Bible is a, is a tremendous, I encourage you to go take a look at it. But one of the verses tucked away in the book of Ecclesiastes, which hints at God's heart in this whole equation, is in Ecclesiastes verse, chapter 4, verse 1. And Solomon writes, wisest man of all time, as he's been referred to other, outside of Jesus, and he is sorting through life and trying to figure out what is wisdom, what is meaning, how do we wrestle and live in the world as we, live, as we see it and as we know it today. And he says this, again, I looked and I saw all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors. And they have no comforter. What? Who gives a rip about the comforting of an oppressor? Evidently, God does. This is a picture of our lives. And I think one of the reasons why God has gathered you and me together this morning you know, we're not here under our own accord. You might think that, but the real reality is God drew you to this place this morning to hear about these songs, to hear Zach's introduction, call to worship, to engage personally with each other. But he's called you here to hear something from his word, to take a look at Jesus in a very particular way. Because you see, no matter how small it is or how big it might be, we wrestle with oppressed. Those who are oppressed. And I want you to think for just a moment about the two voices I hope you hear in your head this morning. One is mine and one would be reading of the word of God. But the other is I want you to be very particularly sensitive and keenly attuned to the spirit of God. Because God and his Holy Spirit is large and loud and he will speak to you. So I want you to be aware of that. And even when I say you care about the oppressed, who comes to your mind? Who is it in this world, in your world, across your street, in your home, in your family that you know is oppressed? Who is it? I thought about giving examples and I, I felt in my heart, no, do not give examples because that would be immediately limiting. As soon as I say something about the identity of some oppressors, that would be too narrowing. And I want the spirit of God to broaden that as much as he needs to in your world, in your heart. Who are those people? It might be on a macro level worldwide. You are dealing with oppressed possibly someplace around the world, but you might be dealing with oppressed across the street, as I said, in your home. But what about the oppressors? How are you dealing and thinking and wrestling with the oppressors in this world? This is where God is going to speak to us. Because as you can well imagine, during that time in the Holocaust, we heard museum, we heard more than once, where is God in all of this? People wrestled with God. We do, you do, I do. Because we're finite, we're human, we don't have him figured out. We wrestle with mystery. 
and he welcomes that wrestling. But fortunately, he also gives us context, and he gives us Jesus. He gives us Jesus to help us wrestle with this. And what Luke does in our text today, in Luke chapter 4, excuse me, I had Luke 4 in my mind earlier, it's Luke 18 and 19. And what Luke is doing in 18 and 19 is he's telling, he's going to tell us two stories. Unfortunately, humans separated the first story with the chapter break of 19 from the second story. And that contributes to our thought that those two stories are like separate, separated, but they're not. Luke tells us both of these stories on purpose. Luke wants us to see how Jesus deals with one, an oppressed man, Bartimaeus, a blind man, and he wants us to see how Jesus deals with an oppressor, Zacchaeus, a tax collector in that day. So Luke is going to tell us two stories about Jesus, but those two stories have one point. And that one point Luke wants us to know, and the Spirit of God wants us to know, is found at the end of the story in Luke 19, verse 10, and it's simply this. This is the one point. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's the point of us, Luke, telling you and me about Jesus dealing with a blind man, an oppressed man, and Jesus dealing with Zacchaeus, an oppressor. The point of both of those stories is simply this. Jesus came for both of them. Jesus came to seek. That means to find, to pursue, to hunt down. He came to save, to rescue, to make whole what is broken, and to restore what is damaged. But the scandalous nature of the gospel is simply this. When I use scandalous, I mean it's almost like offensive in some respects. There's an offensiveness to the gospel of grace because at our first glance we thought there's no way that is right in our humanity. But then we realize that God completely redefines who grace is to go to. So to think about Jesus finding, pursuing, hunting down, rescuing, making whole what is broken, restoring what is damaged. And when he says the lost, he means both because of this story. He means the oppressed and the oppressor. Jesus is pursuing, hunting down, rescuing, making whole what is broken, restoring what is damaged in oppressed people all over the world. And he's done it for centuries. But he is also Finding, pursuing, hunting down, rescuing, making whole what is broken, restoring what is damaged in oppressors. And that's the scandalous nature of this gospel. But we need to keep in mind that while Jesus is going after the oppressors, he is opposing their oppression. Keep that in mind. There is a justice to all of this in Jesus' perspective. He is opposing their oppression even as he is pursuing them as people. And that's God's call to us. That's why he wants us to look at Jesus. And it's simply this. God wants you and me to think about in a fresh way today, what does it mean to receive the grace of God? And what does it mean to extend the grace of God? That phrase, if you've been around the church for years, is nothing new. You've heard that idea of receiving the grace of God, extending the grace of God, except you've never heard it today. This is the first time today you've heard that phrase. There's a particular reason you and I are wrestling with receiving the grace of God, thinking that through, and extending the grace of God. There's a particular reason you're here today why we're thinking about that, especially as we think about those oppressed and oppressors. So we are here to think fresh about what does it mean to receive and extend the beautiful, scandalous grace of God. If there's one thing that I think God wants you and I to walk out of here with this morning is simply this, a fresh wrestling with. What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? And what does it mean for us to receive the grace of God and then to extend the grace of God, the beautiful, scandalous grace of God?
Consider this for just a second before we read the two stories in Luke 18 and 19. You and I may be wrestling with God for this one reason. That our view of who he is, how he works in this world, and how he applies his grace is way too small. That over the course of time, we have let our own humanity, our own preferences, define and explain to us how God is at work in this world and how his grace is flowing. And we're wrestling with that. And bottom line is we have restricted, we have minimized how God works in this world and how grace is applied. So let's be willing this morning, as I've tried even in preparation for the today, to let God say, okay, I want you to expand. I want you to move. Show me in a fresh way. What does this mean? So let's read about Jesus' interaction with the blind man, Bartimaeus, in Luke 18, verse 35. <clears throat> As Jesus approached Jericho, he's approaching the city, but he's also on his way to Jerusalem. This is what's called the travel narrative in Luke's gospel. Way back in Luke 9, Jesus said, I'm setting my face toward Jerusalem. I'm headed to suffering. And everything that Luke puts in his story, the gospel account from Luke 9 through the end of this, his gospel, is with that journey in mind, that travel. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem. And on the way to Jerusalem, which he just described what's going to happen in the preceding passage about being crucified, insulted, flogged, killed, but rising again as well. They're headed to Jerusalem, but in that journey, they are approaching Jericho. And a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked, what's happening? And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And so he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Did you notice the change? It wasn't Jesus of Nazareth anymore. This man had an idea that Jesus was indeed, in fact, the Messiah. That's why he called him son of David. That was a very particular title for Jesus. It indicates that he is the Messiah. So this beggar calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him. And they told him to be quiet. And he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. Jesus stopped in his entourage with his followers, with the crowd on their way to Jericho. He hears this man crying out for mercy and he stops. The same is true for you and me crying out to Jesus for mercy, for what we need from him. He stops and he listens. Our cry for help arrest Jesus. And he stops and he ordered that the man be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? That was a legitimate question. Jesus was not stupid. That was a legitimate question because the man might have just wanted alms. Just keep giving me more money and keep perpetuating. But today I want some money. That was a legitimate reason why Jesus said, what do you really want? Do you want just more alms? And he said, no. Lord, I want to see. And that was a pretty significant statement for this man to say, I want to see. Basically saying, I want my life to be interrupted, radically changed. I don't want to just sit by this road anymore and receive money. I want to be responsible, stand up. I want to see. I want to work. That man never went back to that road after this day. His life was forever changed. He had responsibilities now. He could not just ask for alms. He said, Lord, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith in me has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praising God. They changed their tune. They were grumbling. They were, they were not happy about him at first. And then they got on board and they said, this is amazing. And they were praising God as well. So that's the interaction of Jesus with the oppressor. With the oppressed, excuse me. Now in Luke 19, we have Jesus entering Jericho. And he's passing through the city. And there was a man there by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was not just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. 
He was taxing his own people for the sake of Rome. He was deeply hated by the people. More than we can probably ever imagine the hate. He was a chief tax collector. He was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. And because he was short, he could see, he could not see over the crowd. And so he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So he had to actually run ahead, get up in a sycamore fig tree, which had big leaves. So in a sense, he wanted to hide. He wanted just to get up above the crowd and look at Jesus, but he really didn't want to be seen because he was in this fig tree. And all the people saw this and they began to mutter. Oh, excuse me, back in verse 5. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up into the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. So instead of the man calling out to Jesus in this scenario, Jesus calls out to the oppressor, to Zacchaeus. He sees him in the tree. He says, I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter. Jesus is going to be with the guest of a sinner, a tax collector, Zacchaeus. He defiled himself going into the home of Zacchaeus. But Zacchaeus stood up and indicated that repentance and change had really come to his heart and life. And he stood up and said, Lord, look here. Here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've been cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. I will do right. I will make it right. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation, rescue, healing, wholeness, redemption has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. He has believed in the seed of Abraham, Jesus, and has become a son of Abraham. There are so many things we could be focusing on this morning, both with Bartimaeus, the blind man's story, So many things we could be focusing on with Zacchaeus, too, up in the tree, coming down, his response to Jesus. But I want us to to reflect on this this question simply, and Morgan, we can put this up. How are you responding to Jesus' question? The question in verse 41, what do you want me to do for you? And this is where I want us, which I've tried to asked God to do in my own heart this week and even this morning, what do you want Jesus to do for you today? What is it? I want to leave that broad. What is it that you need Jesus to do in your life today? What do you want him to do? Listen for a moment. What are you hearing? What do you want him to do? But then specifically, is there a way in which God is speaking to you about receiving his grace? Is there a way in which Jesus is speaking to you in a particular way? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you today in a particular way. How is it that you need to receive his grace in a fresh way? My wife, Cindy, uh, has a little card up in our uh, window above our sink. And it's just a little card from a birthday card I got, I gave to her, a little pat on the back, a little <clears throat> humble brag. Um, but one of those cards, she pulled the card out and it just says simply this, be gentle with yourself. Are you your worst condemner? When you evaluate your life and you look at what you're doing and how you're going about your life and you don't see very good things, are you the first to jump on your own back? Are you the first to condemn your own life and behavior? Are you the first to say, you know what, you you don't have it all together and you're the first to do that. And you're not telling yourself the truth about the grace that Jesus is extending to you. Do you need to hear in a fresh way from Jesus? He is extending his grace to you in a fresh way. In all of your mix-ups, in all your failures, in all of your sin, he is extending grace to you in a fresh way. 
But also, how is he speaking to you? What do you want Jesus to do in your life as far as extending grace? This is, again, where it needs to be quiet. Because the minute I start listing some specific illustrations, that narrows the scope of what the Spirit might be saying to you right now. Where is it that God is challenging you right now to extend his grace? I'm going to give you a full mo- a moment or two to reflect on that and listen. What are you hearing? Is there a face that's coming to your mind right now? Is there a scenario that's coming to your mind? Who is it that you need to be extending grace to in a fresh way? And then a similar question is the second one here is the, I want you to reflect on this. The situation that happened with Zacchaeus and Jesus. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. I've got to come into your life. I've got to come into your house. Jesus has purposes for entering Zacchaeus' house and his life. For extending grace to him. So why in the world might Jesus need to come to your house today? Why would he need to come to your home, your relationships your sphere of influence, wherever you move about, why is it that Jesus might need to come to your house today? Who is it that he is calling you to extend grace to? That maybe you've not thought about. Who is that? Would you be Considered a a gracious person. What kind of work does God have to do in your heart, my heart? I was humbled this very morning with my heart and extending grace. This very morning, knowing this was coming up. What is God saying to you? In the brochure that they give out at the Holocaust Museum, the first page says, this museum is not an answer. It's a question. But then it follows through, and the answer to that question, they say, is this, and it's a good one for you and me as we close this time. What is your responsibility now that you've seen and now that you know? Jesus extends grace to the oppressed and the oppressors. So what is your responsibility now? What is God calling you to do? What is he calling me to do? But then secondly, what is our responsibility as friends gathered together in this new beautiful entity that we're still working on a name? It's coming. You'll hear more about that in probably just a couple weeks. Whatever we call this new beautiful entity that he's pulled together, what is our responsibility? To seek and to save the lost, the oppressed, and the oppressors. That's what brought us together. That's what brought us together. That was God's fundamental purpose. He knew that Christ Community Church needed to get unstuck. So for months and better part of a year before we blended, God was stirring in us. You're stuck. You need to think about the lost and seeking them. And what does that mean in a more intentional way? God had been doing that in cross current for years. That had been a strength of your DNA. and, And he brought us together for this purpose. So that we together, better together, can seek both the oppressed and the oppressors in our world today. Seek to see God's life in them, make them whole, restore them. That's what brought us together. That's what is causing us to move forward. We want this together. It's shaping our vision, our mission, and our vision. Our values, our mission, and our vision. It's shaping all of that. It's shaping our search for the next lead pastor. 
That's one of the requirements of the DNA of this next lead pastor we have is that this person has a heart to seek and to save the lost. That's fundamental to the search process and what God is doing there. So we're going to close. One response today that we can have is simply this, is to pray. Simply pray. And years ago, somebody gave me a book entitled Deepening Your Conversation with God by a man named Ben Patterson. And in that book, he shared for the first time in a fresh way this passage in Revelation 8, verses 1 to 5. And it describes prayer in a way that I'd not thought about it before. And it's simply this. John writes about Jesus. And when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. When I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets that were given to them, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood before the altar. And he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all of God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. And when the angel took the censer, he filled it with fire from the altar and he hurled it back to earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And George Herbert, the fine poet, referred to prayer as, the, as reverse thunder. And Patterson said many times when we pray, and it will be quiet when we pray in just a moment as we close, it will be quiet. And we may tend to think that that's describing what's happening, that it's a quiet reality going on. And Patterson reminded that nothing could be further from the truth, because as we pray... Our prayers are ascending to the throne of God, getting mixed with the Spirit of God and getting hurled back to earth in peals of lightning and thunder. There is activity happening as we pray in the heavenlies that we have no idea about right now. And so I'd like us to pray. One, we're going to put up that um, a scene of, of Alfred at first. We're going to put, the, put that picture up of him. So we're just going to take a moment. Would you just pray? for oppressed people that come into your mind. Would you take a moment, and as you think about some people who are oppressed, macroly in the world, in a macro way, big global situations, or very micro across the street, in your home, in your world, who comes to your mind? Who's oppressed? Pray for them. Take a moment. Pray for them. Morgan, if you could put the other picture up. If you're ready, you can guide your prayer. You can pray for oppressors. Who is it that's coming to your mind that maybe you've never thought about praying for? The person is evil, wicked, is oppressing. Who do you need to pray for as an oppressor to know the grace of God? Father, as we close out this time this morning, I thank you that even though there was a quiet to our time right now praying, that it was anything but quiet in the heavenlies. Father, in some mysterious way, you are moving even now in people that are oppressed because of our prayers and bringing your grace and your justice 
to them in some way, in some fashion, in some form. But Father, Father, we're also reminded that you have heart for the oppressor as well, for the tax gatherers. And Father, we're also thankful that our prayers for that group of people was anything but quiet, that you were moving and working and drawing them to the grace of Jesus, to becoming whole and healed. Father, please do that. Would you please refresh in us, refresh in me what it means to seek and to save the lost? What does that mean for us, Father? We look forward to our days together. We look forward to how we're going to walk with you and see that happen in some fresh ways and some new ways. Father, we want that deeply, and we're looking forward that by your power, your word, your leadership, your grace, your spirit, you're going to do that in and through us in some new ways, and we're looking forward to that. We're grateful First and foremost, Father, for the way in which you reached out to us. You stopped and you listened when we cried to you. And you have saved us. You have rescued us. Father, please continue to do that good work in and through us in ways that we've never dreamed about before. For your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So oh. 